Hello Trauma Thrivers, welcome to our video today and I'm delighted, absolutely delighted to be interviewing Judy Crane and Judy is one of the world's foremost experts on trauma and thank her so much for giving us her time this afternoon and I just want to give you um, some background on Judy and actually what she's achieved, which is phenomenal, over her three decades in this industry. So she's worked in both residential and outpatient settings. She is certified in all of the following, in addictions, in sex addiction, as a hypnotist, in EMDR, um, and she's an internationally recognized specialist in healing trauma and PTSD. Over the last 17 years, she started first off The Refuge in 2003, which she then sold in 2013. And she's now started one of the leading treatment centers in trauma and PTSD in the world called The Guest House, which is in Florida. Jude is a sought after speaker. She's a presenter on PTSD and sexual trauma resolution. And she's currently also a consultant for many of the world's leading treatment centers and trains their clinical teams. So I am thoroughly thankful to her for giving up her very precious time to be with us this afternoon. And I really want to see if we can get to the nitty gritty and help as many people as possible that are going to be watching this, um, who are more lay people, I would say, than clinicians and starting out, Judy, on the trauma journey themselves. So I, well, I want to say, I want to thank you so much for inviting me to to uh, share this time with you um after reading that that long list of 30 years and all of those things the much more important part of that is that um uh, i i finally got sober at age 42 um and uh, in 1987 so it was a long long time and a, an insane journey and a whole lot of trauma events starting really early on in my childhood and throughout my life and then certainly um, uh, complicated even more by my addiction and what that looked like. So um, it, it's wonderful that I went back to school and did those things that, that we can do in recovery, but all of the other things leading up to it gave me the impetus to do what I, what I do today. Um, you know, it was this great gift, number one, that I found recovery yeah. uh, because they're at the point that I got sober, I didn't believe for one minute that that was going to be possible. And what I didn't realize at the time, and I'm grateful that I know now, is that um, when I was such a chronic relapser, and what I know today is when we get overwhelmed by emotions and sensory body body emotion body feelings, um, that we are in a place where we can only do a couple of things. We can go crazy, which I certainly have done that. Um, we can attempt suicide, and there are way too many of us that are successful at that, or we can relapse, and relapse is the sanest option at that point. Yeah. And, uh, and so consequently, when we relapse on whatever we relapse, whether it's substances or behaviors or what, whatever comes along, you know, uh, uh, shoes. I mean, we joke that I have this addiction to shoes. Uh, even in my recovery, I know that I can get relief, and that's what that's what we're looking for. So I just wanted to put that in there, um, because everything that I know about trauma and PTSD and treatment, I learned on my own journey, and I learned from the people who became my clients along the way. They taught me. Wow. And so I think that that's an important piece. Yeah, that's a very important piece, and thank you for sharing that too. What what was the impetus really at forty two to get to do the work because I know it's so frightening for many of us, particularly with addictions, to kind of turn around and face ourselves and face not only the addictions but the trauma that's underneath those. What what gave you that strength? Well, one of the things I, I think that, that there were a series of things that brought me there. You know, as, as it is for most of us uh, along the way, that it's, it's not it's not any one thing, but. But the thing that finally happened for me was, you know, I, I was holding family secrets 
Uh, I was holding back all of the things that had happened to me and to my sisters, to my family. Uh, we just didn't talk about it. We're an Irish Catholic family. We didn't talk about any of those things. And so I, it's one of, one of the reasons I kept relapsing is because I couldn't, I just couldn't talk about some of those God awful things that were sitting on my spirit. But, um, um, I got the opportunity in treatment to do a life story. And there were, interestingly enough, I was the only woman, seven men and a, and a male therapist. And I had to read my life story. And it started out with, um, um, I was born on October 21st, 1945. And I'm pretty sure I'm responsible for the atomic bomb. And, and then I read all of my life story. And it was like a shopping list. And I read it with no feeling no emotion, just the list of things that had happened. And when I lifted up my head, there were three men in the group who were crying. Oh. And that was stunning to me. Why? why what, what, are you, what are you crying for? And they were crying because there were terrible things that happened and terrible things that I had done and terrible things that had been done to me. And it was, it was one of those light bulbs. It's like, okay, maybe there's something going on here that's more than just me putting a needle in my arm or, or, or having a drink. And so that was kind of the beginning. And then I went in to a meeting that night and a woman, like they say, someday you'll hear your story. And she was up there telling my secrets. So all the stories that I had, she was telling it. She had been a horrible mother like I had been. She had done some awful things in her recovery. I mean, in her addiction, um, in order to have her addiction be to, to continue. All the things I'd done. And she did it, and she said, and, you, and on the front of my book it says this, she said, we're not bad people trying to get good. Yeah. We're wounded people trying to heal. Yeah. And that was really important to me because I was so sure that I was going to go to hell. I mean, I believed that to my core. And the, it was the, those two things gave me some hope. And I, I really think that was the beginning. And I honestly didn't know, I, I didn't have the language to say trauma or PTSD. It took some more years of that, of learning that. But, um, but I certainly knew then that I could no longer hold on to the secrets that I had to start telling, yeah. uh, with, at least with another person. And, and that was the, the beginning of it. Yeah. That's the beginning of the work. And, and after you made the link between the addiction and the trauma, how did you then go on to begin the trauma um, healing? Because I know in your book, you've said mm -hmm. about layers. And I often say with my clients about, you know, you don't mm -hmm. heal trauma overnight. It's, it's layer yeah. after layer after layer. So yeah. I wonder what your and, and process of that was like. Well, I think, you know, it, it, it started with the basic coming into 12 step recovery and doing those basic things and fourth step. And then, you know, and, and, you know, in the beginning, we stop using, so there are no chemicals. We start to feel really good. And then an event will come along that will kind of throw us for a loop. And, and it's like, okay, I, I don't know what this is about and have to look at it. And so over the years, I would do a piece of work not realizing exactly what I was doing. And at the time, I was a counselor. And I began to learn from my clients. I really began to learn from them. Um, they would begin, they would take a risk and tell me a story that they had never told. And it was my job to be able to hold space for them yeah. and be able to hear it. And I prayed a lot because I wasn't sure what to do next. And every time I prayed, I got an answer and there would be some, some piece of work that I would have a client do, write a letter or do a collage, never quite knew, but I would ask, what do you need? And I think that's one of the most important things that a therapist can ever ask. What is it you need? Yeah. And from that, I can create um, some kind of a healing experience. Yeah. But I really, and I think any therapist who's a good therapist knows that you get the direction from your client yeah, because totally. they've been searching for you for a long time. And once they find somebody they can have that rapport with, you, you know, you can just keep on moving along the space. Yeah. And, um, and again, I've been doing this a long time and I just did this yesterday with, with a couple and I, w I started to laugh when I got done because I've been working with them a while. And I said, okay, so what do you need from me now? What's the next piece? And they both told me and two different things, but they both told me. 
And we started laughing because they were really clear about what comes next. Yeah. And, and that's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, that's amazing. So you trained, didn't you, after your counseling in lots of other kind of modalities. So you did, I'm really I, intrigued by the hypnosis and what you think of that, uh-huh. around trauma. Uh-huh. And then you did the EMDR. So I wondered kind mm-hmm. of what techniques or tools you use or you've used on yourself, mm-hmm. what's worked and what's mm-hmm. not worked really. Well, uh, what I again everything you know everything that i learned it was like one more step of learning and the, and the reality is that trauma is visceral sensory and cellular once i understood that and i'm looking i'm looking at okay what therapy works what doesn't and i kept you're right i kept going to one class after another you know i've got my degree i went back and got my masters when i was 50 and and i just kept going and kept well, anything that came to my to my to my face, I would go out and do. And so I can do, all, there are lots of things that I do and I use all of them, not all at the same time, obviously, and not all with the, with the clients, but I can use hypnosis with somebody who, who um, is more able to dissociate and be able to tap into that place. Or I can use psychodrama or art therapy or music, or um, we work with equine therapy, yeah, we I work see. with the ropes course, you know? And, and those things work. For me, all of those body therapies worked. Yeah. Breath work, somatic experience, really powerful. Yeah. Because we start to release everything we've been holding for such a long time. Yeah. And I also say to clients, and I don't know whether you believe in this too, my own healing trauma journey, I, I've literally tried all sorts of things mm-hmm. and they tend mm-hmm. to, they, it's almost like they tap into a different cellular structure or, yeah. you know, they, they work on different angles or different areas. So I never say one way is the way. There, and and I, I'm, glad, I'm glad that's the case for you because there isn't one way. What works with one client will, will not work maybe that day Maybe another day it will work, or maybe it will never work with that client, but it'll work with the uh, with someone else. And so, it's it's if, if you don't have a big toolbox yeah. and know how to do those things, then you know then you're going to be at a loss. But um, but it but it is that, and it does tap into another another place. Um, I um, I know that I hold a lot of things in, in my body, yeah, and and. And I know when I'm overloaded with it because I start to recognize shoulders, neck, and, you know, this is where, where it is. And I, and I have to, you know, sometimes it'll get, you know, oh, okay, all right, well, whatever I'm holding, I need to find out what that is. And it may just be going to the massage therapist at that point and getting some relief. Um, but we, you know, again, a good therapist knows a lot of different modalities. Yeah. And we don't have to be an absolute expert at every one of them, but we have to have some skills. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I also like the part where you say that, you know, everything is holistic, you know, Mm -hmm. and you work really holistically at the guest house. And also that informs, I believe the next question I wanted to ask you was a bit more about the spirit to healing method. Uh Uh-huh. Um, I started spirit, spirit, spirit. Sorry. Yeah. I, yeah, no, I, I started that, um, well, I guess it's almost 15 years ago. And the reason I started it, there were two things, um, and something you and I talked about, uh, our, my clients in treatment, they would come and they were with us for 90 days minimum, sometimes longer than that. And then they would need to go home. Sometimes we could put them in a sober house in, in our neighborhood or, if they were going back to the other side of California or coming back to the UK, I'd have to have a place to send them. And there were not a lot of trauma therapists. There were not people who understood how to do this work. They were still doing more cognitive work, which is not, which is not where trauma sits. And, and so I thought, well, I guess I'm just going to have to start training people. And I did. I went to South Africa for eight years in a row and trained a program in South Africa, trained all of their staff, not just the clinicians, but the, the auxiliary staff. So everybody who works with, with trauma clients yeah. knows how to be with them. You know, just, you know, whether they're going through a, a tough time 
while they're having dinner. But we need to do that. So I started training people, trained them all over the United States. I've trained here and in Dublin. I've trained in Iceland and, um, um, and obviously South Africa. But now I have people all over the world that when I have a client who is, is moving, moving on from me, God willing, I have a place to send them. Yeah. Um, but they're still not enough. They're not enough trauma therapists. Yeah. And then in addition to that, I started doing five-day intensives. And I was doing that for the family members right. because um, the people that I worked with, and you may have found this to be the case, were chronically relapsing. So yeah. they had been in treatment multiple times. And at this point, I would get them when it was <laughs> like the last resort. And the families would say, I don't understand why they keep relapsing. And those intensives were to be able to help the family because the trauma sits not just in that person, the identified client, yeah. it's in the family. Yeah. It starts sometimes before that client is even born. It starts intergenerationally. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's the work. That's, that's the kind of work we do in an intensive. And when the family comes in and does their work, it makes it possible for your client, my client, to get better. Yeah, totally agree with you. And so the five days of the spirit to spirit healing for the, is that mm -hmm. just for the family or can individuals come and do that five day or course as well? Any, anybody can come, anybody okay. can come. And, and sometimes Lou, um, I'll have people come in who, you know, who say, you know what, I just need to come in and do five days and they come in for five days and go right into treatment because yeah. it you know becomes really clear that yeah. that the trauma is sitting much too close you know so um so it it's a it's a good pathway for yeah. for many people to to be able to say you know to look at what what they're dealing with and where they are on that continuum you know and do you run those at the guest house we do um i run most of them at the guest house however i have i have done them all over the country too Okay. Um, you know, somebody will ask and say, can we do an intensive out in Palm Springs or up in Connecticut? And we do that uh, because it's the, that intensive is always with a waiting list. Yeah. Um, and I just, uh, we, I wish we had more time to do more of them yeah. because they do make a difference for the families, but, um, but they're always pretty full. So the guest house is your passion and is the treatment center that you're running at the moment. And I, and mm -hmm. I wondered whether it might be a, an apt moment, if you don't mind, because I love the Rumi poem and why you picked it. I uh -huh. read it in the book, uh -huh. which I'm going to uh -huh. ask you about. And I just thought uh -huh. it's just a beautiful poem. So yes, it is. We, want, we, were, we had been looking desperately to find the right property. And at that point, we were looking all over the country, all over the United States. Um, we were in Kentucky, we sent a horse farm, but we couldn't get it zoned. We were in another part of Florida, same kind of thing. And then one day, one of my old employees from the refuge came and he said, I found you a place, Judy. And I said, really, where? He said, oh, it's just five minutes from here. And I laughed, I thought he was just pulling my leg. But here was this tucked away, this beautiful small horse farm with a beautiful house on the property and a couple of extra buildings, um, two beautiful horses, and just at 52 acres, and, and it was there. And, and the goal with my partner, I, we wanted to start a small program, an intimate program. So we started out with 15 beds. We only have 27, we don't, we're not going above that. Um, but it was funny, when we were trying to find a name for it, at the time it had a name that was called um, Fallen, Fallen Oak Plantation. Well, I just didn't think that that was the right name. So I would be in the supermarket going up and down the aisles thinking, all right, so we'll call it um, Glory Dishwashing. No, that's not good. <laughs> I, just ridiculous. To, yeah. really credit read, no. I mean, I just, we were just, Lovely. just crazy for, for a, a name. And then, I mean, I love Rumi and one of my friends had given me that poem and when I reread it, I went, this is, this is what we want because this is exactly what we're going to do. This yeah. is the work. These are my people that, that we're looking for. And, and, we, and, and the main thing when people come in is telling them you're, you're, you're not going to feel terrific at the beginning. 
because it's going to come in and you're going to have to just wash all this away so that you can clear out this container. And when you do, amazing things happen. But as long as you have all of this negative um, traumatic events still sitting in your body, nothing else can happen. The good things can't come. Yeah. And it's funny. We joke. I have people who come to us all the time who can't get pregnant or they're stuck in their job. And I just tell them, do this work. Let's get some clearing. And the next thing you know, we have babies all over the country Uh-oh. from people who have finally, you know, when you're, when you've been traumatized, it's very difficult yeah. to trust your body enough to let uh, a miracle happen. Yeah. And when you do the work, that's exactly what happens. Yeah. You know, you're the container of your body and your spirit let go and, and you can start and, and have the new things, wonderful things come into your life. But you have to do that work, yeah. you know. beautiful and it and it encaptures trauma doesn't it perfectly yeah. and that kind yeah. of journey that we need to take mm-hmm. exactly yeah exactly because it is it's it is terrifying when people come in because they they see oh i'm gonna have to open up on things i've never wanted to touch i've been medicating this for a long time if i if i don't medicate this i'm gonna have to feel it and that's the thing that people are afraid of because they're afraid if they start feeling this, they'll start crying and never be able to stop or they'll start screaming and never be able to stop yeah. or, the, or, you know, or they'll get so depressed that they'll, they'll never come out of it. And it's, that's taking a real leap of faith yeah. to be able to come in and say, I'm going to hand you my secrets. I'm going to tell you what has hurt me and, and pray that we can do this together. And we do. Yeah. We do. Yeah. And I, and I guess it's about doing the trauma work as soon to the, at the beginning as possible to prevent relapse, Mm -hmm. but you can do that because you're in a safe residential setting, you know, so that's why it's great for people to come into treatment for trauma because when Mm -hmm. they're coming once a week for an hour. Um, I, I tell therapists all the time, it is not, it is really, really dangerous to open someone up when you only have them for, you know, for one, one hour a week or even two hours a week. Yeah. That's when I started doing, you know, sometimes I'll do two and three day weeks, uh, uh, you know, uh, with sessions. Like I, I came here to do an, uh, um, a conference and while I'm here, I, I have a couple that I work with and we did a couple of days here together and we, we go from morning to night do and you- that, yes, yeah, that helps. So I, I, I have three clients I've been seeing while I'm here, and I do that. Right. Um, but you can't do that in one hour and then send people home. That's not ethical yeah. because, you, because you can't close them up quickly enough. You yeah, know? yeah. But, uh, it is challenging, so that's the work. I'll be honest. And I mean, you know, lots of my clients are probably going to watch this that do an hour uh-huh. a week, that kind of old uh-huh. You know, and I use EMDR a lot. So, you know, we are going Mm -hmm. into it, then trying to close it. And then, yeah, it's not ideal. It's not ideal. I hear you. If I can recommend something, because I, this is what I learned. What I know is if I've got a couple of people that I'm working with privately, individually, the next step is to take four or five of those and make a group. They're working on similar things. And that's a perfect opportunity because now you're really getting a lot of work done when you do group work. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree. Mm-hmm. And I am actually, funnily enough, starting an intensive with five other people this year. Yeah. Uh-huh. To work through their sexual trauma, funnily mm-hmm. enough. Yeah. Good. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. And also doing, I don't know whether you've heard ever of Elan Shapiro. He's an Israeli that started the GTEP process in EMDR. So it's group EMDR. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, Wonderful. It's really interesting. And you can do it. They're doing it with all the refugees and, and uh -huh. you know, disaster zones. So you do, you can do it in a group and you get them to mm -hmm. tap themselves and draw right. pictures and artwork on a big kind of, uh -huh. it's really, really powerful. So yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to try that GDC. I'll let Good. you know how that goes. Good. Yeah. I love that because we do that kind of thing with somatic experience too. We can do that kind of in a group setting. Um, and, and I mean, group work is really powerful, um, especially when you can create that kind of rapport. The, the uniqueness of our trauma kind of goes away because then you go, oh, you yeah. too? You yeah. know, like me too. Yeah. yeah, it helps that identification with others too, doesn't mm -hmm. it? It really helps. Right. So you're in London at the moment, but you're also coming back in May yes. for ICAD. Yes. What are you doing right. at, at the wonderful ICAD conference this year? Well, um, I, in my addiction, I was using a different drug with each child. And so I have three children. My son is now 51 years old, but he was my crystal meth baby. Uh, I regret to say that. And then my second child was my daughter, Maria, was my heroin baby. Um, and then Michelle was my methadone baby. She's the youngest. So Tom is a fabulous therapist. He jokes and he says, we've been working together for 50 years. And uh, he became a therapist when he was three. Did he? Oh, I was so yeah. Deep, yeah. He was so deep. I was so deeply into my addiction, but he's a great therapist. So we, 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 we are doing a full one-day masterclass. We have done that several times Fantastic. Um, here. And, and so the, um, and it's not just for clinicians, but uh, clinicians come in and, and learn and get those CEUs for it. But we're doing um, two pieces. We're doing the purpose of purpose, the meaning of meaning, why we do this work. And then in the afternoon, we're doing intergenerational trauma and wow. connecting all those together. So um, it, it, we're, it, it's good work. And I can tell you that we're usually packed. People sit on the floor, which I find hysterical um, if there's no other space. But it's as uh, Sam at ICAT has, has just been really generous with us. And, um, you know, and I lo we love doing that. So that's what we'll be doing. We all love and then we'll, that as well. we'll, Yeah, we'll be there all week and I'll bring books. And, brilliant, you know. brilliant. Do you know what, what day you're presenting on yet, the, the whole day? Uh, I don't, no. I, I don't often. I should I'll, know, I'll but I I'll, I'll, I'll add it in for the people watching because I'm sure okay. there's lots of people that want to come and see that. You know, an intergenerational trauma aspect of trauma mm -hmm. is so important yeah. too, you know. Exactly, um, exactly. Um, uh, it, it, I mean, it's, it's a really vital piece. Yeah. Um, and, and again, once, once we get the family work to do the work in there too, it, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. And just, just as an example, this couple that I'm working with um, work sideways with their children too. And, and it's really powerful. You see this whole family coming together and I've been working with them for, since August and the difference is dramatic. Yeah. But if we hadn't done work with the children too, you know, there would be all of that turmoil going around. And so I, I just had such a good time seeing the, the shifts and changes because they've all done the work yeah. and, and that's how the healing happens. Yeah, I agree with you. And for those people that can't make May or ICAD, they can always mm -hmm. get your book because you've written yeah. The Trauma Heart, which is, yeah. is available now on Amazon and, and it's out there. Uh -huh. And how, how, how did you write the book? How did you get down <laughs> to doing it? Well, I, from the time I was a little girl, I wanted to be a writer. And I got, you know, I, I was doing a whole lot of other things in my life that were not conducive to writing, although they make a great story. Yes. And so um, I, I really wanted to have the book for the family so they would understand, especially that tagline that we're not bad people trying to get good, because I, I'm sure you've heard from families, what's wrong with my kid and the kid may be 50 years old what's wrong with my kid there, there, there must be something you know wrong with them or they're evil or you know they're, they're really bad 
And, and it's none of that. It, it, it's the way we survive is by our behavior. It's the only way that we can so, survive some of these traumas that we've experienced. So it, it, the book was about being able to help people to understand exactly what trauma looks like and why we relapse in all of these behaviors. You know, and, and relationship and sex addiction is always involved there. Eating disorders and self-harming behaviors. And so as you, if you've seen, you've seen the book and there, I've got tremendous stories and work from, from some of my alumni. They were so gracious in being able to put their work in there um, because they're, they're miracles and they're miracles from all over the world. You know, you would hear these horrendous stories and think, how in the world did, did, did my folks survive? But they survive because they have some resilience and they go in and do the work and they, and what we end up doing is shifting the, um, the, the traumas that we experience and look at them with a different perception. Okay, what is special about me because I experienced that? What, what gifts do I have because I survived that, because I can thrive? And that's, that's a whole shift in the way we, we vision ourselves. Yeah. And that's what's important. Yeah. So I started writing that book when I was, um, um, it took me about five years because I was doing a lot of other things. And I finished when I was 70. So from the time I was 10, finally 70, I wrote the book, and there we are. And, uh, uh, it's a, uh, writing a book is more fun than you can imagine. It stirred up all of my issues. I had, you know, I have a therapist, but I had to go back and see him. And I weeped and wailed and snotted and cried because I had told the story again. Yeah, and it's like you know, and that's what we do. Yeah. But that wow, that's, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's lovely, isn't it? Because it gets to be a different story the more that we work on it. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. we're telling exactly. the new story or the recovery story rather than the mm-hmm. old story. Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. 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 So interesting in that we talk about surviving trauma and I wonder what you thought enables us to actually thrive because of our trauma. I mean, obviously I've got trauma thrivers and I've uh-huh. said for a long time, it's very difficult to be able to fully thrive, you know, be out there, have a voice, earn money, mm-hmm. you know, do all the mm-hmm. things that people do when they're fully thriving. And I think those yeah. of us that are stuck in trauma feel quite threatened for a long time about a long time mm-hmm. about being too visible or being mm-hmm. too vocal. Mm-hmm. Or, I, was, right. I yeah. wonder what you thought about, you know, the ability to really thrive th- through our trauma and come out the other side. Mm-hmm. Well, I think, I think what happened, certainly what happened for me is that um, um, I was I, probably two years sober and I was still questioning. I mean, I, I was thrilled to be sober because I never believed it would happen. Um, but I was still questioning what was wrong with me that I was capable of those things and what was wrong with me that, the, that those other things had been done to me. And, you know, and I was still struggling with the why of it. Why? Okay, I'm sober now, but why? Why all those things? And someone asked me to speak at the woman's prison. And I went and I thought, you know, what do I have to tell these women? Well, actually I have a lot to tell them. And I went in and I talked about being a mother who had been using different drugs and how awful that was, how God awful that was for me to be filled with guilt and shame and remorse. And it was part of the reason I couldn't get sober because I was feeling such, you know, mother's guilt is just enormous. And, and then I had been arrested multiple times and I, and, you know, in and out of bad relationships. And as I'm telling my story, I'm looking at these women and clearly I had, I did have something to tell them. And I realized that day that I was an, um, Uh, I was an example of hope and that if those women could look at me and see that, that I could, that maybe they could. And that was the day that I realized I had a purpose and that my addiction had a purpose and that my trauma had a purpose. And I think that that's the difference between um, surviving and thriving is when we finally find a purpose in our life and recognize that, um, 
number one, I'm not a bad person. I'm wounded. And that my wounds, you know, um, are, are worthy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I don't ever have any problem talking about my past anymore. You know, yeah. there's nothing... Um, there's nothing that I'm that I'm ashamed of anymore, um, and and all of that has made a difference. And yeah. you know, so I've had people ask me at the conference, you re- you know you really talk a lot about you know you talk about your personal life and how do you feel about that? I I feel fine yeah. that I can do that yeah. because I did not like who I was when I was in the middle of it. Yeah. And on the other side of it, I'm okay with who that woman was and who I am today. So I, 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 I hear you and I think it's a gradual process and I think it's a gradual process for me that I've been through in being mm-hmm. able to share those secrets, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and, each, and, and the kind of depth gets more, doesn't it? I mean, I, I did a TEDx yeah. talk a, a few years ago and I was kind of oh. able to talk about then you know, the mm-hmm. addictions and the psychosis. Right. I was psychotic at 24 and, um, uh-huh. you know, quite able to put that on a stage in front of 400 people. But there were things still that I couldn't mm-hmm. quite yet stand on a stage yeah. and, and do. And now uh-huh. I can do all of it like you. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, with no shame. It's a, it's no shame. But it's a process. It's a, it's process. a process. Yeah. There's this, this, there's, it's funny, there's a story that I've been telling in the past, I don't know, three or four years, and I I just told it at the conference, and I had never told it before, ever, to anyone, and I was standing up there, and and what it is, is that, you know, my mother and father had been in this terrible battle all the time. Um, There were some things going on in the marriage, and, um, and my father was punching holes in the wall rather than rather than to hit her. And I was the oldest of four girls. I was about 10. And I'm trying to get my sisters all calmed down because that's my job. And we lived in a small little house. And the noise stopped, the yelling stopped. I heard my mother cry, but I didn't see my father. I didn't hear him. So I went downstairs and my father had his head in the oven. Oh. And I had never, ever told anyone. I had never told anyone, Lou, and I was on the stage and I was telling that story because I was trying to help someone, the, the folks to understand what came next. And what came next is he got up, he left. I don't know where he went. We never talked about it. And again, I was 10. I'm telling the story when I'm 70. And I never told mother, my mother, she died with never hearing that story. I never told my sisters. I told it on the stage. And then I said, and after my father left the kitchen, I went over the kitchen counter. I got a piece of white bread. In the U.S., we call it it's Wonder Bread. It's soft, soft bread. Put butter all over the bread and put sugar all over the, the butter. And I had a sugar sandwich. And it raised my dopamine and it raised my oxytocin and it raised my serotonin. I didn't know what was happening, but I had my first sugar sandwich that I was medicating with. Wow. Yeah. And I, but, and when I told that, you know, those people in the audience, one of them said to me, and you never told that story to anybody except on the stage. I said, no, but it came out when it was, when it needed to come out. Yeah. And I don't remember exactly what, what triggered it, but somebody in the audience needed to hear that. Yeah. And, um, and I told it, you know. Wow. God, that's a story. And that's a huge trauma. Bless you. Yeah. And I just had stuffed it away yeah. until the right moment. Yeah. 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 So back to the layer upon layer upon layer and finding mm-hmm. voices and our stories bit by bit mm-hmm. by bit and starting to be able to share them, you know, mm-hmm. hence the group work and yeah. Yeah. And really I think, I work. think, I think we, you know, we just don't, I don't know what will come next. You know, something will come. I know um, 20 years ago, I, I, when, I, when I was 27, um, my husband died of an overdose in the bed next to me. But then 20 years ago, I was in this lovely marriage and we ended up divorcing uh, because of his midlife crisis. And I was really healthy, but 
it stirred up a whole lot of, and that's, life is just going to continue to stir up stuff. Yeah. And we just have to be prepared to know we're not totally healed. Yeah. Something will come along and, and we'll go up. Oh, okay. Here comes another one, but I'm ready for it. You know? Yeah. And if I'm not totally ready, I have people around me who can walk with me through it, yeah. you know? And, and that's my job is to make sure that I'm surrounded by people. Who can. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the goal is to never be triggered again, because how do we ever dissolve every cell that's ever uh -huh. been through trauma? Yeah. You know, it's like right. a job of continuous becoming, isn't it? Uh -huh. But as yeah. long as we can thrive and help and have a purpose and be functional and contented, that's a wonderful mm -hmm. place to be, isn't it? And, and a hope yeah. for our yeah. clients as well. Lastly, I suppose I just wanted to ask what's next for you and also what you hope for the future of trauma treatment, really, what your wishes are. I'm not sure what's next for me. I kind of wait to see. Um, uh, um, I am incredible. Uh, you know, people are asking me that again. Yeah, uh, I'm, back. I am, back. yeah I'm really, really busy. But I love what I'm doing. One of the, there, there are a couple of things that I want to do. I, I have heavy on my heart. I want to be able to go and work with some of these refugee children in Syria and some other places. Um, I, I mean, it's really, really heavy on my heart. But in conjunction with that, what I would like for our industry, for our field, is for us to start younger. For us to start with the children. Yeah. Because if we can intervene on the trauma that our children are experiencing, if we can get them when they're five and six, yeah. we can stop a whole lot of insanity that happens along the way because we're trying to survive. Yeah. And, and in, in, in our, in our, in our quest to survive, we obviously we end up uh, using behaviors that start out being, you know, saving us and end up being, you know, detrimental. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I would like for us to start really start younger um, but we've got to get a whole lot more people trained in trauma work. We really do. Yeah. And also for you, for you, I mean, you know, I don't know what, what the States is like, but for the UK, unless you can afford trauma treatment or therapy mm -hmm. one to one, it's very, very mm -hmm. difficult to access help. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, in the U S um, more and more, we're more and more I'm, I'm able to train some uh, nonprofits, some public programs, and, I, and I'm doing that. Um, but, you know, it's a big country, yeah. a lot of people, a lot of treatment centers, and for the most part, most of them are still 12-step programs. Good 12-step, good I don't mean that, yeah. but we need that other, we really need that other piece. And, um, and we just, you know, it's a, it's a process. It's a whole lot more than it was when I started. Yeah. A whole lot more. Yeah. People now are using the words trauma and PTSD and they didn't for a long time. Yeah. But we hear it everywhere now. It's, yeah. it, it's truly acknowledged. Now it's a matter of putting everything in action. Yeah. And I think the same here in the UK, but I think that we're still treating addiction, eating disorders, mm -hmm. depression, anxiety, yes. and, you know, very seldom is the word uh, complex PTSD used so we spend mm -hmm. too long here at the symptoms and not getting uh -huh. the cause which is yeah, the underneath exactly. stuff exactly and that's what we do we do it all at the same time because trauma are the signs and symptoms you know that the the addiction that we use the survival mechanisms are the signs and symptoms of what we've experienced why we needed to use and, and as you know so we have to do, we do it all at the same time. Yeah. We do it all yeah. at the same time. And it, and if we can keep people long enough, because 30 days is not enough, no. we're just coming out of the fog. Yeah. So and not, we have a good 90 day program that is really powerful. And if we can keep them longer in sober living, even better, the yeah. longer in treatment, the better. But it's, a, you know, it, our, fortunately, insurance is paying in the U.S. now for Great. a lot of us. Great. And, and that's helpful. And we, we just have to keep on, you know, pressing, pressing that yeah. um, insurance button. Yeah. 
Well, I just want to thank you for all that you do for our industry and the addiction and trauma field. It's really inspiring and encouraging. And I hope I make it out to Florida one day to see you. Well, we're going to, we'll get you there. We'll get you there one way or another. And we'll see you for dinner at ICAT. Yeah, definitely. And thank you so much for today and your time. I know that lots of people in the group are going to find this really useful and your sharing of self so inspiring. So thank you, Judy. Thank you, Lou. Thanks for asking me. Bye-bye.